Good morning. This remote meeting of the Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee is called to order, and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Long. Present. Vice Chair Acom. Present. Minority Leads Wazinski. Present. Representative Bierman. Representative Christensen. Present. Representative Holland. Just to give a second, leave the volume up. Present. Representative Hornstein. Hornstein present. Representative Lee. Lee present. Representative Lislagard. Present. Le Representative Stevenson. Representative Bo. Present. Representative Franzen. Representative Grunhagen. Present. Representative Igo. Present. Representative Macklin. Present. Representative Munson. Munson present. We have a quorum. Present. Representative, present. Representative Lippert is present as well. Uh, record will reflect that Representative Franzen and Representative Lippert are also both present. Uh, thank you, members. We have a quorum. Uh, today, we are going to be uh, looking at the issue of uh, natural gas costs and considering two bills um, on affordability options to help uh, ratepayers. Uh, and the uh, first bill we have up today, uh, well, before we have bills, excuse me, we're going to have two presentations on uh, the current status of natural gas price affordability in the state. I will first hear from Annie Levinson Falk, the executive director of the Citizens Utility Board. And then we'll hear from Kevin Lee, Deputy Commissioner with the Department of Commerce. Uh, so first, Ms. levinson Falk, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, and thanks for inviting me to present this morning. I'm going to try to share some really simple slides. I thought a visual might be helpful today as we're going through this. Um, so um, I'm going to speak about gas affordability. I'm, and I'm sorry, I'm Annie levinson Falk, Executive Director of the Citizens Utility Board. Um, I'm gonna talk about gas affordability kind of primarily from a customer standpoint. So um, I wanna share uh, some of the factors that are really driving up gas bills by presenting a gas bill from last year and this year and kind of looking through um, from what you see as a, as a utility customer, um, how you can see the factors that um, are making the biggest impact in driving up those bills and talk about the broader trends in terms of um, what this means for affordability and looking at the numbers about customers who are having trouble paying their utility bills. And um, I understand the Department of Commerce, um, Deputy Commissioner Lee is gonna speak more in more detail also about um, kind of the, the reasons that costs are going up and what's being done about that. So I will leave that to him. Um, but just to start, here's a, what a gas bill looks like for um, one customer. This is not, you know, we didn't go looking for a special case here. This is just, uh, a regular customer, this person happens to have service from Excel Energy um, and what their home gas bill looks like um, this January versus January of last year. So I just wanna highlight some of the differences. So first of all, the bottom line number is, is vastly different. That's a huge increase from one year to the next. Um, uh, you know, more than doubling your monthly bill is, is gonna stand out to people. Um, the first reason you can see for, for why that happens is that this person used a lot more gas. They used 266 therms, that unit of gas, versus 190 in 2021. Um, and the reason behind that mainly is because January was a lot colder this year. We had a really cold January. It wasn't the case in 2021. I'm sure everyone remembers how cold it was. Um, and so you just needed more heat. Um, looking at February, you know, we had cold February this year and last year, so you don't have necessarily so much of that difference, but for January, the weather was a big factor. Um, another factor and, and probably the biggest factor overall so far this year that's, that's driving those um, natural gas bills up is the cost of the gas itself. Everyone, I think, is familiar with this. Fuels prices are way up this year. Um, so the green square shows the cost of gas. That's like the cost of a therm of gas that the utility pays. They purchase the gas and pass the, the price straight through to customers. Um, normally that's just an automatic pass through. So whatever the utility pays, the customer ends up um, directly kind of just, just paying. 
Um, for Excel, the, that cost of gas has more than doubled between January of 21 and 22. Um, different utilities are seeing a little bit of a um, different increase, but across the board, everyone sees, sees those prices up. And like I said, I think that's the, that's the biggest factor that is causing those larger bills this year. Um, but there are a couple of others. And so you can see that the, just the bill is a lot longer in 22 than it was in 2021. There are some new line items that didn't show up last year. Um, the first one in the orange there is interim rate adjustments. What that means is that Excel has come in to the Public Utilities Commission and asked to increase their base um, cost of gas. Um, that's known as a general rate case. So they file the general rate case for a rate increase. Um, while a rate increase request is working its way through the process towards approval, a utility can um, raise rates that, you know, a portion of that amount in the interim, and that's what that is called. So um, Excel Gas has that. You see that also Center Point Gas. Um, they're also in a rate case. So Center Point customers see an interim rate adjustment on their bills as well. Um, Excel Electric and Minnesota Power Electric customers, same thing. Um, there's multiple rate cases going on right now. And so that's, that's a smaller impact, but it's a part of what's going on on your bills. And then you see there's two lines that say a pricing event surcharge. Um, it's kind of technical why there's two different charges for different parts of the month. But the main point is that um, this is an extra charge that is slowly paying back those extraordinary costs that were incurred last February. So everybody remembers winter storm Yuri that froze from Minnesota down to Mexico, um, froze off uh, natural gas production and transportation down in Texas and some of the Southern states so that the supply just wasn't there. And then there was huge demand because of the cold weather um, throughout the middle of the country. Um, prices shot up to historic levels and Minnesotans um, and people elsewhere just incurred really enormous amounts of cost to buy gas during a very short period. To kind of put it in perspective, um, these costs have been spread out over something between about two and a half to over five years, depending on who your utility is for the, for the regulated utilities. Um, so five years, we're gonna be paying these down in many cases, and that's just costs that were incurred over five days. Um, really a kind of historic amount of costs. So like I said, they have been spread out so that the impact on any one bill is not so huge for um, customers of the regulated utilities, but you can see here it's $12. That's 10% of what their January 2021 bill is. It's not nothing. So all of these add up to what you're seeing here, a really large increase in the overall cost of the bill. Taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. Oh, sorry, before I do that, I just wanted to know, you know, we, this hearing is about natural gas, but like I said, it's not just natural gas prices that are going up. Um, I think everyone is probably familiar with this, but fuel prices are kind of up across the board, no matter what your heating fuel is. So for homes um, that heat with propane or fuel oil, which is quite a, a large portion of Minnesotan, Minnesotans, especially in the rural areas, um, they're seeing really high prices among, among the highest that they have been over the 20 years that um, Department of Commerce provides kind of average pricing. So it's, it's hitting folks, no matter what your heating fuel is, you're, you're just seeing higher prices right now. Um, but back to natural gas, the, the regulated utilities, so all the for-profit utilities plus Dakota Electric Association, they all report data every month um, on how their customers are doing. And this includes the number of people that are in arrears. So the number of households that are behind on their bills and the amount that those households owe. And so that allows us to take a, a look at the trends, which I find really useful to, to understand, you know, how is this hitting um, Minnesota households? So the charts here shows the, the trend lines in the number of households that are behind on their bills. And you can see 2019 in blue, 2020 um, up through 2022. Here we have the first amount of data for this year up through February so far. Um, and what you're seeing is that, you know, overall there's not necessarily, there's, it's not that a lot more people are behind on their bills because the 2022 February number is, is pretty in line with where it's been. Um, 2021 was a bit of an outlier, but it's come back down since then, partially thanks to, I think, um, increased energy assistance that's available. And so the number of people that are behind is roughly in line with where it's been over the last few years. But if you look at this next chart, which shows the uh, average amount that a household that's behind, the average amount that they owe, um, you can see that that has really substantially increased. So 
the average amount a household owes here is, um, you know, it's around like $430, $440 per household that's behind. Obviously, some people aren't that far, but some people are, are into the thousands of dollars that they owe. Um, compared to where we were in 2019, which was, you know, maybe 260 or something like that. So it's really been a, a very substantial increase over the, the last um, two, three years. And, um, you know, to me, that reflects kind of the general economic condition that you're seeing elsewhere, which is that through COVID, through the economic impacts of that and, the, um, and what we're seeing right now in terms of the economy, a lot of folks are able to, to weather that, you know, didn't lose their jobs, were able to work from home and are, are doing okay, um, or in many cases better, you know, the stock market is up, but for folks who um, tend to maybe have trouble paying their bills um, and had been falling behind, they're bearing the, the brunt of those impacts. And so people that were having trouble or are just falling farther behind have fallen farther behind. Um, we'll see that in utilities too. Um, I guess I should note here, you, you see a hole here. I just remember this. Um, there was an error in the data in June, 2019. So we just omitted that month so it wouldn't look weird, but you can kind of just connect that with your eyes. And what you're seeing in terms of trends is, is um, the folks who were behind are now substantially more so. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, I'd be happy to take questions at the appropriate time, but I, I'll, I'll pass it along to the next presenter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Ms. levinson Falk. Uh, next, we'll hear from Deputy Commissioner Lee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair Long. My name is Kevin Lee, uh, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Commerce. I'm also joined here today by our uh, Government Relations Director, John Kelly, and our Assistant Commissioner, uh, Catherine Blauvelt, who runs our uh, Energy Assistance Program. So I'm going to start uh, a few slides here. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, I want to talk a little bit following up on Ms. Levinson Falk on you know, what's happening in terms of fuel prices, uh, natural gas and delivered fuels. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why it's happening uh, and what's being done about it. So get my slides there. So a few uh, of the takeaways. Um, so of course, on the pricing side, uh, there have been some significant movements in, in natural gas. I'll get into uh, what's driving that. Uh, that is, as Ms. levinson Falk described, flowing through to customers' bills. There is the lingering impact of, of the really extraordinary events uh, of Winter Storm Uri. Um, and there's been a particular jump uh, for heating oil, which is um, a pricing mechanism that is uh, sorry, uh, closely tied to crude oil. Um, and so in terms of what's being done about it, I wanted to mention a few of the programs that Commerce has to help folks who are struggling with their bills. Uh, we're gonna talk about energy uh, assistance program. We also have a number of programs that are designed to uh, permanently re reduce uh, household energy burdens. Um, things like our weatherization assistance program helps to make uh, houses more energy efficient so that those bills uh, stay down uh, permanently. So in terms of natural gas, uh, so what you're looking at is uh, the winter heating season. And as the chart goes from left to right, that this will go through the price for every week from October to March. And so what you're seeing is the black line on top is our current heating season, uh, which is, as you'll notice is significantly higher than in, in years past. You'll also see the scale of, of just how extraordinary the event from Winter Storm Uri was. That's the orange line there uh, with, with the spike in the, in the latter half of the heating season. Um, so it has been uh, quite significant. It's largely uh, driven by the fact that uh, the long-term supplies of natural gas uh, have really gone down um, and, and also uh, just, just continued demand is really what's driving it. I do want to mention on the outset that, that one of the things, uh, despite these price increases, that is at least somewhat fortunate is that we in the US tend to be at least a little bit insulated from some other price spikes that happen elsewhere. You'll notice that prices for natural gas in Asia and Europe are uh, significantly higher than they are here. That's mostly due to the fact that we produce a lot of our own natural gas uh, and we have fairly limited um, exports of them. Uh, fully understanding that that is of little comfort to, to someone who's struggling with their bills um, right now, uh, but also helpful, helpful context. So uh, 
And I, recognizing that that this is mostly about uh, natural gas prices, I do feel like it would be remiss to not point out that 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 heating oil in particular has experienced a surge. Uh, this is driven again by some supply constraints and also the events in Ukraine. So that spike you see there for prices this year in heating oil is uh, uncertainty and concern around uh, the, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty significant rise there. We are, you know, we're not certain yet whether that level off will continue. It's obviously very hard to be confident about geopolitical events, uh, but hopefully that, that level off will, will continue. Um, but it's difficult to be confident about that. Just for a little bit of context about that sort of price spike in crude oil, what we're dealing with is uh, a, a classic supply and demand problem. Uh, what this chart is showing, the gray area is, is how our supply of crude oil typically looks and the blue line is what it's at right now. So you saw demand really go down during COVID and production went down. And now that, that demand is ramping back up, we're experiencing a real uh, uh, you know, impact uh, between low supplies and, and high demand. So in terms of how this affects consumers, uh, I, I'm not gonna cover you know, all the great stuff that Ms. Levinson Falk covered. Um, I will just mention uh, a few things about the role of commerce in, in this issue. Um, we have a number of hats that we wear uh, in this field. We advocate for the public interest at the Public Utilities Commission. Um, that commission itself uh, sets utility rates. Um, it, it does not set the price of, of gas or crude oil. Um, there's a couple of dockets uh, that are open right now uh, pertaining to these issues, the rate cases, the investigations into the winter storm URI um, that are all ongoing. Um, and then lastly, I just want to talk about uh, how folks can get assistance right now because this is uh, such a serious issue. Um, our energy assistance program provides direct financial assistance for families uh, that need help paying their energy bills. Uh, and so for you know, any of your constituents who are struggling, we have phone numbers, websites uh, that will be helpful, mn.gov slash energy, energy assistance. Um, we have also had a one-time increase in the availability of funds from the federal government. Uh, and so we have been able to raise the income eligibility uh, to the maximum allowed. So a household of four people could earn about 68,000 a year and still qualify for energy assistance. Uh, it applies for uh, homeowners, it applies for renters. Um, and the average household receiving assistance is about an income of, of 19,000. We've seen a huge demand, uh, a huge increase in demand for this program rather, around 100%. Uh, we have also increased the crisis maximum, which is a you know, special uh, dispensation from uh, 2,000 to 3,000 to, to help prevent disconnections and allow uh, delivered fuels households uh, with low fuel to fill their tanks. Uh, so with that, uh, I and uh, other members of, of Commerce staff are available for any questions, and uh, we appreciate you taking the time, Chirla. Thank you so much, Deputy Commissioner. We have about uh, 10 minutes uh, allotted for questions, if there are any, um, before we move to our bills. All right. I'm not seeing hands, so I uh, appreciate uh, the testimony very much, and we will proceed uh, to our bills. So the first bill we have up is House File 3944, Representative Sandstead's bill. Um, and I will go ahead and move uh, House File 3944 be re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. We also have a, a DE1, uh, as my understanding. Um, Representative Sandstead, this is just to get the bill in the shape you would like us to consider it? That is correct, Mr. Chair. Okay. I will uh, move the DE1. Any uh, discussion to the DE1? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The DE1 is adopted. Um, and then Representative Stanson, maybe I'll have you explain your bill before we uh, get to the, uh, the other amendment that's been uh, offered for today. 
I'm not aware of another amendment that's been offered for today, Mr. Chair. So the one you and I discussed, Representative Sands said uh, with uh, that Representative Stevens will be offering. So. Oh, thank you, um, thank you. That one I am aware of. Thank you. Um, so what my bill does is um, it creates a refundable tax credit for ratepayers that were impacted by the polar vortex, whether they were residential or the municipal utility itself. And again, this bill is specific to municipal utilities. Um, I know they're not the only ones impacted, but this language that I have currently in this, this bill is for municipal utilities and their rate pairs. Thank you, Representative Sandstead. Um, Representative Stevenson, would you care to offer the, the A4, which I believe is a friendly amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the A4 uh, amendment. Uh, I really appreciate uh, what Representative Sandstead is doing here and how uh, she has really recognized uh, the pain that this uh, unique experience has had upon uh, people who get their uh, electricity from municipal um, utilities. Uh, I represent some of those people because uh, Anoka uh, has a municipal uh, utility um, that serves the people of Champlin. Uh, but, uh, you know, we know in greater Minnesota that's, that's even more the case. So I really appreciate Representative Sandstead's leadership and fighting. Uh, for those people. Uh, what my amendment does is it uh, adds a, a program to address customers of uh, uh, IOUs, uh, so Excel, uh, Minnesota Power, uh, Ottertail, uh, because uh, uh, we uh, have seen, um, of course, I mean, again, we're talking about natural gas here, excuse me, but IOU customers, let's leave it at that. I, sorry, it's been a, I got a bill on the floor later today. I got a bunch of committee hearings. My brain's in 16 places, but the point is, that uh, we have uh, a lot of people who are suffering, not just municipal customers. And so this is, uh, in, in addition to the great work that Representative Sandstead is doing, we wanna try and add uh, some relief for other uh, Minnesotans across the state and relieve the, the pressure that they are seeing on their energy bills, which is really uh, difficult because of this extreme weather event that was the polar vortex. Um, so this creates a new account and, and uh, would allocate money to that account. And I'd ask members to support the A4. Any discussion to the A4 amendment? Seeing none. Up, oh, seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The A4 is adopted. Uh, Representative Stanza, do you have a further introduction to your bill before we go to your testifiers? I do. <laughs> okay, so Sansa. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for the opportunity to present House File 3944. Again, this bill was um, developed in response to the polar vortex that gripped the Southern United States back in February of 2021. And it impacted my municipal uh, utility here in Hibbing along with others across the state. How could a weather event uh, thousands of miles away impact a city like mine on the Iron Range? Well, long story short, our community, our community was gouged as Hibbing has a municipal utility, HPU, and practically overnight, ratepayers in Hibbing experienced over a 5,000% hike in their energy prices. And I wanna be clear, I did not misspeak, over 5,000%. Over five days, residents and businesses saw energy costs spike 5,000%. Hibbing incurred increased energy costs of $1.6 million over what they had already budgeted for uh, gas purchase in those five days. One business in my community saw a $40,000 increase in their monthly gas bill. Many constituents of mine had to go on uh, payment plans in order to cover these costs. With shorter contracts and purchase agreements, HPU simply does not have the capacity or the cash flow to budget for such a massive price hike. As a municipal utility, HPU doesn't have the protections the Public Utility Commission offers and we have no price gouging laws currently in Minnesota. There was no other option but to pass along the bill to the utility owners, the same as people, the ratepayers. With businesses and families already struggling due to COVID, this price hike could not have come at a worse time. This bill would allow the Commerce Department to offer rebates to 33 municipal utilities like HPU that paid for wholesale natural gas during the polar vortex. The bill also offers refundable tax credits for ratepayers who had excess energy costs. 
The federal government should have been um, addressing this hardship, but I learned that there was unfortunately no appetite to address that issue. With a $9.2 billion surplus and with fuel prices still very high, it makes perfect sense to use a portion of these dollars to help out our municipal energy consumers who are unfairly socked with high um, energy bills across the state. And I, as I said, I realize this isn't just impacting the municipals. We do have to have the conversation with the IOs and other entities, but this is a great place to start. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to turn it over to my testifiers. Thank you, Representative Stansed. We have uh, six people on the list for today. And first we will hear from Kent Sulem. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ken Sulem, Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association. Uh, we thank our President Sanstead for bringing this bill forward. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe you had a similar bill a year ago that we tried to get through. Um, as was stated, this event was an unforeseeable uh, impact on our uh, customers. It was of the 34 utilities who we were fortunate that a number of them uh, received their gas from uh, Canadian pipelines and had little or no effect, but they're still protected under this bill. Uh, but there were the remainder that were served through the Southern pipelines uh, that suffered incredible expense. They number of them did try to spend down some of their reserves uh, to mitigate the costs to their customers. Of course, these reserves are intended to cover um, equipment replacement, operating costs increase, et cetera. Uh, they were intended to put a year's budget into a three-day period of time. I've submitted a written testimony, so I'll be brief and let you hear directly from the utility uh, directors themselves that can explain the impact in their communities. But it was statewide, and you'll hear, I think, some very similar stories. Um, keep in mind that some of the utilities that have smaller impacts uh, maybe, you know, 750,000 doesn't sound as much as 8 million, but they also have only 100 customers to spread it on as opposed to larger fields. So uh, economy of scale is something that's important to, to keep in mind when you're uh, looking at the impact. So I will stop and be available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sulem. Uh, next, we'll hear David Olson. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you. My, my name is David Olson, and I am the Director of Finance and Administration at Owatonna Public Utilities. Uh, the February 2021 20, natural gas pricing event dramatically impacted OPU and our 12,000 customers. OPU's natural gas cost for February of 2021 was an unprecedented $9.4 million, which was $8 million more than budgeted. This resulted in an average cost of $340 for each residential customer. To put it in perspective, the added cost of this five-day event was roughly two-thirds of our customers' average annual natural gas bill. To soften the impact on our customers, OPU used cash reserves to pay the $8 million in higher gas costs and then spread the billing to our customers over 12 monthly installments. Even when spread over 12 months, this caused further strain on many customers that were already experiencing financial impacts from the pandemic. I encourage your support for this bill. The funds uh, will provide much needed relief to OPU customers and other customers in the state who through no fault of their own, were impacted by uncontrolled pricing of natural gas needed to heat their homes and businesses during a cold Minnesota winter. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, next on our list is Luke Peterson. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chair, and uh, special thanks to Representative Sanstead for bringing this issue to the forefront. Um, as Representative Sanstead has been so um, keenly aware from the beginning of the polar vortex, um, Hibbing, like many municipal uh, utilities, are not uh, benefited from long-standing practices of uh, capital cost recovery and things like that that can um, really benefit uh, a financial standing that can bear the brunt of an uh, impact and a shock like this. This um, came right to Hibbing Public Utilities within 14 days 
of the event, we received an extra bill for $1.6 million higher than what was budgeted at uh, $700,000 for the month. So we, we basically sucked up all of our extra budget within a couple mi uh, hours of the polar vortex. And within a couple of days, we were faced with the, the struggling decision of what do we do? And at a time when COVID was surging and businesses were hurting, we had no choice but to pass this on to our customers. And if I'm able to, I'd just like to share a, um, uh, something here, if I can. Um, am I able to share my screen or some slides? You should be able to, yes, Mr. Peters. Okay. There we go. Let me just share um, just one quick chart here. And uh, are you able to see this uh, chart? If you scroll down a little bit. Oh, there you go. Perfect. All right. There you go. So this is the chart of the actual gas usage inhibiting during the month of February of 2021. The green line that you see right here represents how many decatherms we were consuming at the time. So in early February, you can see as the temperature started to go up, also our gas usage started to go up. And then early in February, we had the gas prices right around $2 a decatherm. That was the normal gas price we all thought before all the prices started going up. And then right away on the 9th of February, heading into the weekend, we started to see those wholesale prices um, jump up. As some of you know, we have a, a combined heat and power plant here in Hibbing. Um, we ended up switching the power plant from burning gas to coal. And that's what resulted in dropping down. We completely eliminated using natural gas in the power plant to manage costs for our ratepayers, And that dropped almost 5,000 decatherms of, plant, of usage from our system. This would have been well over $2.6 million if we hadn't had that flexibility. Um, but then you see the prices going. So the $1.6 million we have was just for those five days in February. Um, just like um, Dave and Owatana talked about the, just the impact per household, we were right around two to four hundred dollars extra per household for that. And some of our businesses, including the Foundry in Hibbing, which I'm joined with um, Jordan Olmsted today from Northern Foundry, um, who is here and represents a large employer in town, they were just starting to ramp up. So, um, are you able to unmute Jordan? Yes. Please, please introduce Bye. yourself for the committee and uh, proceed. Good morning. My name is Jordan Olsgaard. Uh, I work for Northern Foundry here in Hibbing, Minnesota. Uh, we employ about 100 employees here. Um, in the foundry world, uh, energy is really the lifeblood of the manufacturing process. It's also our highest cost item on our income statement. In the last six years, our energy costs have increased by 48.4%. Increases at our other two plants in Michigan are at 9.9% and 7.4% in the same time period. The foundry world is a nationally competitive market, and we're expected to keep our costs competitive with plants in other states. But our highest cost line item has increased by, I repeat, 48% when our other plants have increased by less than 10% in the same period. Due to the poor management by the NPUC, we're struggling to remain competitive with foundries that operate with lower utility costs in other states. Our corporate office is very aware of the state's inability to maintain fair and competitive utility rates. We can no longer offer competitive pricing to our customers because they can get lower pricing at foundries that do not need to deal with our state policies that we've been forced to deal with. New jobs and new work is being rewarded to plants in Michigan and Indiana. We need our state to offer solutions at lower utility costs. And on top of these huge increases, we cannot afford the $100,000 plus costs that we were hit with due to the polar vortex about a year ago. We need the state of Minnesota to help keep our energy costs competitive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peterson, were you concluded? That concludes my statement um, from Hibbing. I also wanna speak on behalf of the city of Two Harbors where they had um, a similar impact of 1.2 million extra for a city of only 4,000 people. Um, they're, they're in the middle of the tourism um, bust of the COVID pandemic as well. Um, many of the bars and restaurants in town that rely on tourism were already struggling. So their bills went 
quadrupled again from 1,000 to 4,000 and put many out of business. So thank you, um, Chair Long. Thank you, Representative Sanson and all members of the committee. I'm happy to be available for questions after this meeting as well. Thank you. Uh, next on our list is Chris Manderfield. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Um, good morning and thank you for your time today. Um, I'm Chris Manderfeld. I am the utility director for the Nuon Public Utilities. Um, we are a town of approximately 7,500 7, customers. Uh, we're located about 90 miles southwest of the Twin Cities. Um, I'd like to discuss with you the effects of the vo volatile um, gas prices that we experienced in the polar vortex of February of 2021. I have been with the Nuon Public Utilities for 28 years and have never seen a price spike like this in my career. To give you some perspective, uh, the Nuon Public Utilities gas supply bill for January of 2021 was just a little over $727,000. Our gas bill for February with the seven days of high prices was over $7.4 million. As a municipal utility, we had done our due diligence in hedging a portion of our gas at a fixed price, but with the pricing we saw those seven days, it still resulted in astronomical bills. Municipal utilities are nonprofit and they're owned by its citizens and there's no markup on the gas that's passed through. So ultimately it's the customers and the utility that bore the brunt of the gas price surge. This was det detrimental to our residential, small commercial and industrial customers. On the natural gas side of our operation, the Nuon Public Utilities Commission, our governing board approved a buy down of the rate charged to our customers payable with our reserves. The 2.6 million buy down were funds that should be used for infrastructure improvements. The remaining costs, $2 million, were charged directly to our customers through the purchase gas adjustment. We allowed our customers to pay over a five-month period. However, for the Nuon Public Utilities, the impact of the high prices did not only affect, affect our customers on the gas side, but also on the electric side. At the time of the gas price, the Nuon Public Utility had generation running in our power plant. This caused an additional 1.5 million in natural gas expenses on the electric and steam side of our operations. At this time, we have absorbed this amount through our reserves as well, and have just applied an adder to our electric customers bill in March to recoup the costs over a four year period. Again, this is money that should be spent on improving aging infrastructure. The past two and a half years have been difficult for our customers businesses, as well as our utility with COVID, decreased sales and inflation. Representative Stansted's bill would have a direct positive impact on both our customers, as well as the utilities that serve them. We ask that you support this bill and thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Uh, next on the list is uh, Annie levinson Falk. Please uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Sanson and members. Uh, again, Annie levinson falk with the Citizens Utility Board. Um, I think on this issue in particular, Cove has heard from more people who are upset about these charges than probably any other issue in the six years that we've been around. Um, at, you know, as I covered earlier, the, the costs are difficult for some people, but beyond that, um, it's also just made people quite upset. The idea that um, we in Minnesota are you know, through, through no fault of our own or on the hook for hundreds of millions of dollars um, in costs incurred because Texas is, didn't plan for their weather. Um, people are really angry about that. I'm sure you have probably heard from a lot of folks about this bill or, or will if, if you haven't, you know, once, once the folks become aware of it. Um, with the investor owned utilities, um, we've been able to work out some protections for customers, um, including exempting um, people who receive energy assistance and, as I said, spreading the payments out over as much as 63 months. Um, and I know that some municipal utilities, as other testifiers have mentioned, have done their best to, to soften the blow to their customers, but um, they also don't, you know, for various reasons, have all of the same flexibility available to them that the, the investor-owned utilities have. And so I think it can be more difficult for the municipalities to deal with something like this event. Um, and so I, I think this bill will provide really welcome relief for a lot of Minnesotans who get their gas from their local city. Um, and I also wanted to address the amendment um, offered today by Representative Stevenson that, that would go to the customers of the public utilities. 
Um, as I said, the um, energy assistance recipients are already exempt. They're off the hook from having to pay this cost, but um, most low income households don't receive energy assistance. Most people that qualify don't, don't get it. And many people, you know, also make, you know, maybe a little bit more than the income limits um, for energy assistance, but still face a hardship because of high gas costs. Um, and there's also, you know, an, an, um, I think another testifier mentioned this, but there's the burden on small businesses that have been already having a hard time over the last couple of years that we've been trying to figure out a way to address that through their utility bills and just kind of struggling to, to find a, a good way to do it through the utilities. But I think, um, you know, much like residential customers are, these, these bills are really a strain for a lot of those small businesses that maybe are already on the margin. So I do think this could, could be a, a substantial help I think a lot of the question um, comes down to how much funding might be available. I mean, the costs from the events are just massive. For the investor-owned utilities, it's something like $660 million over about five years. So, um, you know, even a, a, another $35 million, if that were available to be provided, is unfortunately almost like a drop in the bucket when you have costs that are that high. Um, it'd probably take a fairly sizable appropriation to make a meaningful difference once you spread that out over all of the customers of a regulated utility. Um, so I just kind of wanted to, to provide that. Um, but that said, because the costs are so high, this is really meaningful for people. So thank you for your continual work over the last year plus to try to figure out a way to provide that. And, and thank you, Representative Stansted, for bringing this bill. Thank you, Ms. Levinson Fox. Our final uh, individual on the list is Will Seifert with the Public Utilities Commission. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee members, Will Seifert, Public Utilities Commission. Um, thank you, Representative Sandstead, for introducing this important legislation. And Representative Stevenson for amending it to extend relief to investor owned utility customers, which I'll refer to as IOUs. The amended bill provides a mechanism to buy down the impacts of the IOU ratepayers via a commission order upon the conclusion of the natural gas price break investigation. I have some brief comments on the A4 amendment to the bill. As you recall, Commissioner Sieben and Sullivan briefed you last spring on the preliminary impacts of winter storm Yuri. During winter storm Yuri, the wholesale price of natural gas went up significantly between February 12th and February 17th, 2021. There were no significant disruptions to natural gas service and Minnesotans were able to keep their lights on and their homes warm during the storm. But utilities spent over $850 million on natural gas during this one, $650 million of which the Commission has deemed extraordinary. In other words, significantly above the previous average price expected in the decade, and is, subject of, and is the subject of ongoing PUC prudence review. The price of the natural gas commodity is deregulated at the federal level and is generally a pass through cost to retail natural gas customers. IOUs do not earn a return or markup on this commodity cost. Immediately following the storm, the PUC ordered an investigation into whether the decisions utilities made about gas purchases and operating procedures were reasonable. The state's ongoing investigation focuses on four natural gas utilities regulated by the PUC, Centerpoint, Great Plains Natural Gas, Minnesota Energy Resources Corporation, and Excel Energy. The PUC will use its regulatory authority to determine if the decisions made by utilities during the storm are reasonable and how much of what the utilities spent was reasonable and prudent and thus can be recovered from the payers. The PUC has also limited how quickly those costs can be recovered on an interim basis. In most cases, spreading recovery out over a 63 month period, collecting interest on the debt was prohibited by the commission and low income customers were also protected during the investigation. The price spike investigation docket 21135 and related individual dockets for Excel, Centerpoint, Merck and Great Plains were referred to the Office of Administrative Hearings for contested case hearings. Public meetings were convened by the Administrative Law Judge earlier this month. The ALJ report is due to the Commission on May 24, 2022. And a Commission decision on the prudency of utility actions will be forthcoming this summer. Because this is an open docket and unable to discuss the merits of the investigation or the other pending rate cases, the bill as amended appropriates funds to a special revenue account that may be credited to investor-owned utility customers as directed by Commission order upon the conclusion of the commission's investigation. All of the money the legislature appropriates would be passed along directly to ratepayers, alleviating some of the financial burden of winter storm zero. At a time of high natural gas prices, this relief is important to all utility customers as they begin to pay back the costs incurred during winter storm zero. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Seifert. Uh, that completes those who uh, signed up to testify. And so we will now turn to member questions. Representative Swazinski. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just a quick question to Representative Sandstead. Um, one of the parts that I kind of I'd like in the bill is this uh, the calculation during the critical period for each customer's use during that high cost. And I'm wondering if we're going to leave potential customers out by doing that. Because if, if you've only used it during the critical period, that, that means or doesn't mean that you're uh, allowed to qualify for that tax credit. And one of the business groups that I'm concerned about is your grain elevators. And oftentimes those businesses are drying grain in the fall, um, which is an off peak time and using a fair amount of BPO, B, BTUs of natural gas. And currently they're being assessed the higher rate, but they won't have access to uh, the tax credit because potentially they're, they're being asked to pay to refill those coffers for the city. How will that affect uh, those particular customers? Representative Sandstead. Thank you so much for that question. Um, to be honest with you, it's an excellent question that I don't have an answer for you today. Um, I know that as I was speaking with the municipals, finding out who was impacted, who wasn't, um, this is a very complex uh, process or, or purchasing and usage process. I would be happy to work with you on this as the bill continues to work or move forward, Representative Swazinski, and hopefully um, come up with something that would be helpful or meaningful. Um, again, my purpose in this bill was to really offset the impact of those, those five days. So if that is happening at a different period in the calendar year with some of your constituents, let's have that conversation and see if we can do something. Representative Swazinski. Mr. Chair? Just yes, a, a follow-up? Go for it, Representative Swazinski. Thank you. Um, just a quick, just to follow up, it, it was mentioned a couple of times, Representative Sand said, um, there was price gouging, gouging uh, in your comments. Um, has that been proven? Has the Attorney General uh, done some investigations that there was actual, or was that just market rate? Representative Sandstead. Representative Swosinski, those are my words. That is an astronomical hike. Um, and I know that uh, Minnesota doesn't have protections right now for municipals. Um, and it certainly appears to me that this was an opportunity for uh, companies to take advantage of a very difficult time. Um, the demand was high and, and they could ask what, whatever they wanted without regulation there. Um, and it certainly seemed to have only impacted that particular time. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then maybe just a question to the Department of Commerce. Um, it was mentioned in uh, debate uh, about the, that there was price gouging. Um, did you see that or what, uh, you know, it was my understanding this was open market, bids were put in, uh, the price wasn't set by these, it was simply, this is what the bid was. Uh, is that accurate? I don't think we have the Department of Commerce on anymore, but it does look like Ms. levinson Falk might be willing to respond. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Spusinski. I think um, I, I share your frustrations. I, I thank you for that question. Um, so I, and rep to what Representative Sanstead said, I mean, the bottom line is that somebody made a, a lot billions of dollars, a lot of money off of people having to heat their homes in a crisis. And um, I think whether that's legal price gouging or not is kind of being worked through right now. So I understand that FERC has an open price gouging investigation. I don't think they're saying too much about it because it's an open investigation. And so we'll see what they find and what the results of that might be. Um, and I'm aware of one lawsuit against one Texas energy company called Energy Transfer that's ongoing right now for price gouging. I believe they were sued by another Texas utility. So um, that, that's all I know of. I, as far as I know, the attorney general for Minnesota doesn't have um, any price gouging suits going. They, I, my assumption is that probably the law is not supported or they probably would have gone after it. Um, so I think we're kind of looking for the, at the federal level to wait and see how that all plays out. Thank you, Ms. Levinson Falcon. Yes, I'll, I'll note that there was a bill to give uh, the authority to the Attorney General over price gouging, but that has not uh, passed yet. Uh, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just uh, 
you know, kind of just a question. So uh, it looks like there's about half of the utilities drew down reserves uh, to refill kind of the pay currently. Um, you know, does this open up any issues with other utilities as far as, you know, the collection of potential interest or uh, this tax credit when it looks at, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, they, they were able to write this off. So if, you know, a business is, is paying an increased rate to the state of Minnesota, like they're using that as a cost in their taxes, how will this affect from a, a accounting standpoint, if they receive something that they wrote off in taxes in 2021, but then uh, because of the higher cost, but then they receive that money back in 2022. From a business standpoint, maybe that's not for this, maybe it'd be for taxes in next week, but how will that affect those businesses, uh, Representative Sanstead? Representative Sanstead, or I could go to Mr. Sulem. Um, I'll take it. Uh, my Representative intent in this, Thank you, Mr. Chair. My intent in this bill, and I believe when I was working with the revisor, I was very clear on this. If they, if a business took it as a tax write-off, then they would not be eligible for um, a rebate or, you know, reimbursing. There, there would be no double dipping on this bill. Um, I hope that answers the first question. And then just to one other thing you said, you thought there were maybe half the utilities that used reserves. I don't think it's that many. I think it's fewer. I think there's probably three to five that I'm aware of that, that used reserves to kind of offset this. So out of 33 municipals, I think half as high. Mr. Sulem, looked like you wanted to chime in as well. Yes, Mr. Chair, um, I was just gonna go over what Representative has said, which was uh, that the double dipping is not allowed. Uh, they'd have to work with their uh, business folks and decide which is a better approach than take the tax deduction or the tax credit. Uh, it's it's an optional thing. I think that the one area where there's uh, a little blurring of lines as far as the impact, we had the single event that caused the spike and the billing for that. Subsequent to that, the cost of natural gas itself, while it came down dramatically from the spike, uh, is significantly higher than it was a year ago. And so in that regard, the ongoing expenses of homeowners and businesses is in fact higher, um, but it's a separate part of the discussion from the spike itself, which is what this bill is targeting. Thank you, Mr. Sill. Uh, looks like that was your final question, Representative Swazinski. Yes, I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chair. Representative Bo. Very good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A quick question for, I believe it was Luke Peterson. Is, it, is that with Hibbing Public Utilities? Yes. Yes. Is he available? He is available, Representative Bo. Hello, Representative Bo. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I wanted to uh, just make a note, first of all, that I'm, I'm happy to see. Did you say that you rolled over to coal to avoid that price spike with gas? Yes. Um, Mr. Hibbing, Peterson. Uh, yes. Can you guys uh, hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Yeah, great. Um, yes, that's correct. And now Hibbing Public Utilities manages not just the natural gas uh, distribution utility. We also have a combined heat and power plant where we produce electricity as well as district steam for our customers. So in the power plant, um, we were able to switch from natural gas, uh, which is a very easy clean fuel to burn to coal um, to when the, as the prices started to go up. And so since then, we've also added biomass back to the Hibbing Public Utilities um, fuel mix so that we have the ability to manage three separate fuels. And, you know, co coal is expensive, especially in our neck of the woods, and it has other issues too. But that flexibility is so important for utilities like ours to manage our costs. Like I mentioned in my testimony, we had saved about over a million dollars just by reducing our gas consumption during those few days. And um, the, the market risk that uh, a, a vastly traded commodity like natural gas is and those exposures to, to spikes needs the fact that we can have alternative fuels to turn to 
And going forward, you know, we, we are still permitted to burn coal. And we also intend to use a lot of locally sourced northern Minnesota biomass uh, going forward. We're, we're getting a little far afield from the bill, but uh, I'll go back to you, Representative Bofi, you have a follow-up question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm just, I'm happy to see you have that flexibility and we're able to, to switch over. This to me just points out the importance of having coal available as a resource as we move forward into our energy future. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bowe. I see no further questions. Uh, Representative Stansett, would you like to make closing remarks to your bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanna say, I think that this is a very important bill and um, I appreciate everybody's help in kind of uh, helping me understand the complexities of uh, purchasing, selling gas costs and the impacts it has on our rate payers. So thank you to all of the individuals I worked with. I hope that you will support this bill as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Stansett. I'll renew my motion that House File 3944 as amended be re-referred re to the Committee on Taxes and the clerk will take the roll. Chair Long. Aye. Vice Chair Acom. Aye. Minority Lead Swazinski. No. Minority, okay, thank you. Representative Bierman is, I believe, excused. Representative Bo. Bo oh. votes oh, aye. Representative Christensen. Aye. Representative Franson. Aye, uh, yes. Representative Grunhagen. Aye. Representative Hollins. Next aye. is just the yeah, his Representative Hornstein. Hornstein, aye. Representative Igo. Igo, aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Representative Lisligard. Lisligard, aye. Representative Meckland. Aye. Representative Munson. Aye. Representative Stevenson. Aye. There being uh, 15 ayes and one nay, the bill is adopted. Uh, the motion prevails and the bill is re-referred to Committee on Taxes. Thank you, Representative Sandstead. Uh, the next bill on our agenda is House File 4567 from Representative Rasmussen. Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I oh. have an author's amendment, the A2 amendment to get the bill in the shape that I would like. Great. I'll uh, move House File 4567 be laid over for possible inclusion, and I will move the A2 author's amendment to get the bill in the shape the author would like. Any discussion to the A2? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? The A2 is adopted. Representative Rasmussen, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, securitization is an important tool that would be available to benefit and protect customers against bill shock, a lot of which we've already heard about today, in case of a unique event that affects the state's natural gas service and results in extraordinarily uh, unavoidable costs. Examples of such an extraordinary event uh, could include a devastating storm, like we saw with URI, or other natural disaster, a cybersecurity attack, or a temporary major price spike in the natural gas market. Uh, this legislation uh, that we're discussing today would be a win for Minnesota, uh, helping to make customer bills more affordable and allowing utilities to recover necessary costs, while also ensuring public accountability with regulatory oversight. Securitization can offer vital affordability protection to natural gas utility customers. It would spread out extraordinary costs over a much longer, more manageable time frame for the issuance of low-cost, long-term, high-quality bonds. More than 26 states across the country have passed securitization in some form. It is a proven option that utilities have used to save their customers millions of dollars. It would be wise for Minnesota to have this policy tool on the shelf and ready to use if needed. The bill is for regulated natural gas utilities only. It does not affect electric or water utilities or municipal utilities. This legislation provides the regulatory and legal framework for securitization if it should ever be needed. Regulatory oversight throughout the process protects utility 
customers and the public interest. The Minnesota Public Utilities Commission would retain the authority to ensure real customer savings are achieved before any utility could be approved to issue bonds. Taxpayers are protected because the bonds are not an obligation of the state of Minnesota. The PUC would monitor the securitization process for the full duration of cost recovery and bond repayment, including an annual compliance review. Finally, it is important to point out that this tool is strictly optional and subject to approval. A utility may petition the PUC for authorization to issue long-term bonds to recover extraordinary costs that were prudently incurred. After stakeholder input, it would still be up to the PUC to decide whether a utility's petition is reasonable and saves money for customers. With that, Mr. Chair, I have a, a testifier, um, Mr. Jason Ryan, who's the Executive Vice President for Centerpoint Energy, um, is here to discuss more and offer testimony about the bill and benefits to Minnesota's natural gas customers. Mr. Ryan, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Jason Ryan, Executive Vice President at Centerpoint Energy. Uh, it's my honor to be able to talk to you all today about this topic. As many of you know, we have the privilege to serve about 900,000 homes and businesses here in Minnesota with natural gas utility service. In other parts of the Midwest, going all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico, we serve more than 6 million other homes and businesses with gas and electric utility service. As it relates to this bill, I thought I'd discuss three things today very briefly and then turn to questions. Um, I couldn't have done it any better than uh, Representative Rasmussen did, but I'll talk a little bit about what securitization is, uh, number one. Number two, how it's been used across the country over the last two decades. Um, and three, how our experience with securitization has been over that last 20 years, and then obviously open for questions. So first, what is securitization? As Representative Rasmussen said, it's, it's a way to get low cost financing for one time large costs to save customers money versus traditional utility financing, especially if it's a capital expense. It's also a way to potentially make bills more affordable if it's an operating expense that you're talking about, such as higher gas prices. It's a tool in the toolbox at the end of the day for stakeholders and the PUC to consider. And as with most things, having more tools in the toolbox uh, is better than fewer when it comes to exploring options for utility bill affordability. In our view, view it's a tool that you want to have, but you never have to use it, uh, which is better than needing it and not having it. So maybe a simplified example will illustrate the, the benefits of securitization financing. Let's say a, a tornado destroys a hydrogen production facility of ours or our call center or our downtown, downtown Minneapolis headquarters or some intentional act destroys some portion of our system of pipe or one of the pipelines that supply gas to us so that we can supply it to our, our customers has some kind of catastrophic event or a cyber event that causes prices to spike off of that pipeline or off of other pipelines since that pipeline is no longer able to serve us. On behalf of our customers, we will pay the cost to deal with those events. And we will finance them through traditional utility methods absent a securitization option. And so what, what does that mean? There's really two options. I can, uh, take out a loan from a bank, uh, so traditional debt, um, and that long-term debt cost could be four to 6%, depending on market conditions. It could be less, it could be more. So I have that as an option. I can also issue equity in my company. I can issue uh, stock in Centerpoint Energy to shareholders so that they would give me their money, uh, but they're expecting a return on that investment Somewhere typically in the 9 to 10% range is what um, equity costs. That also depends on market conditions at the time. So those are my two options. Oftentimes we might use them both for a blended cost of say 
uh, something like that. If the PUC determines that all of those costs were prudent and reasonable, we would recover those costs in rates, those traditional utility um, financing costs uh, and the cost of the remediation for whatever the event was. Or alternatively, if this bill passes, securitization is a third option. Uh, so securitization allows us to issue AAA rated bonds through the statutory framework that's laid out in the bill, which is we're not generally able to get AAA rating on our debt. No utility that I'm aware of can. Um, so that's the benefit here is that it creates a framework for that AAA debt rating. And that financing cost could be, again, depending on market conditions at the time, but 2% or less versus 4 to 6% of debt that I could go get on a long-term basis or nine to 10% for equity that I issue. So that's the statutory framework creates a dedicated revenue stream in customer rates to pay those extraordinary costs. Uh, and the term securitization really relates to that dedicated revenue stream. It is the security behind the debt. Uh, so that, that gives you some context for why the term securitization is, is used. Secondly, let me talk a little bit about, very briefly, how it's been used across the country. You first started seeing utility securitization laws go, be enacted uh, in the late 1990s. And as Representative Rush has said, it's now been adopted in the majority of states for a variety of uses. It could be to recover storm-related costs. It could be to recover costs associated with um, utility assets that are no longer serving customers. Uh, it could be for one-time gas price spikes. Uh, whatever the thing is that it's, that it's recovering, the process is largely the same uh, across every state. There is a transparent PUC process where the benefits to customers are quantified and confirmed before it moves forward. So a simple example, um, if, if I can issue bonds at 2%, uh, under this structure, and my alternative is long-term debt at 6%, you quantify what those benefits are, uh, the difference between the two and the six uh, over the life of the, the debt. Um, and that could be, depending on the, the magnitude of the cost you're talking about, that could be hundreds of millions of dollars of saving. Let me give you one example, and that's the third item, which is what's our experience with it at CenterPoint. Um, we've used securitization five times and we're about to start our sixth later this year in Indiana. Let me give you one example of where we used it for storm costs down in one of our Southern states. We had hurricane damage to our electric utility assets of about $700 million. Uh, that's a significant one-time cost um, that in order to make uh, rates affordable for our customers to recover those costs, we used securitization financing and spread those costs over uh, 15 years. The benefits to our customers in that utility versus traditional uh, utility financing, our state PUC in that jurisdiction found that it was more than $300 million of savings to our customers. So the savings can be significant. Now, it's our uh, experience also that um, this works best as a financing tool when all stakeholders and the PUC agree that it's the right answer. And it won't be all the time. Uh, it is not a silver bullet. I, 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 you all can appreciate that there are no silver bullets in this world. Uh, so it will not solve everything. Uh, but like I mentioned at the beginning, it's a, a tool that's best to be had and never need it but you don't want to need it and not have it uh, when you're trying to address customer affordability. Um, so with that, I'll stop uh, taking up your time and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. Uh, we had one additional uh, public comment from Ms. Levinson Falk. Um, Ms. Levinson Falk, please proceed. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Mem uh, Rasmussen and members. I can, again, Annie Levinson Falk with the Citizens Utility Board and I can be very brief. I just. I um, wanted on behalf of the Citizens Utility Board to thank Representative Rasmussen and um, CenterPoint for bringing this bill forward to make securitization available in Minnesota um, as a way to possibly help protect uh, Minnesotans from drastic bill hikes due to extreme events like um, extreme weather in the future. 
it's, as um, Mr. Ryan said, it's a tool that's in place in many other states already, and I understand has helped to drastically cut bill impacts from these kinds of surprise events. And um, so it would be good to have that option here in Minnesota, should it be useful in the future. I'm sure securitization won't be the best um, option in every case, or maybe not even in most cases, but it's good to have it at our disposal in, in, in case we want to call on it. I, I like the way that Mr. Ryan said, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and, and not have it. Um, so uh, just from a, the customer perspective, I wanted to just add our two cents that we, we think this is a good bill and appreciate it bringing it forward. Thank you, Ms. Levinson Fox. Uh, we'll go to member questions, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and then just this question is to uh, Mr. Jason Ryan from Centerpoint. Yes. You know, just to, you know, you talked about three options, uh, the two previous and then a third one, which is the securitization bill that you're promoting here today. Um, what other, or maybe you're not the person to answer, what other options was used in this latest uh, spike that we saw? It was my understanding that the, the other option is just to uh, do 0% financing um, and just cover the costs and then just bring a rate of return. Uh, doesn't this allow for a higher cost recovery because of the interest rate paid than what was actually used here in Minnesota? Mr. Ryan. Thank you, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you for that question. So as it relates to the utilities option, the, I do not have a cost-free source of capital. Um, so I have to use one of those two options for me to pay the bill to the gas suppliers that provide the gas for us to serve our customers. What, um, what the commission ordered and, and um, what we agreed to was to, for us to eat the cost of that financing. In, in other words, we had to finance those, uh, those costs. Uh, and we will not pass on those financing costs to our customers. Uh, and we agreed that that was the, the right approach. And we uh, proposed to collect those costs over 63 months. So we're essentially trying to mimic ourselves uh, through that proposal, what securitization might bring to the table. And we're not asking to revisit um, the Winter Storm URI gas costs. Um, unless all the stakeholders want to revisit that, right? But that decision was made. Uh, we were in the financial position where we could um, absorb those financing costs for our customers. Not every utility will be in that position, and we may not always be in that position, right? So if uh, while we're doing that, something else happens, um, it limits our ability to absorb the financing costs in order to uh, prevent our customers from paying those financing costs, right? So typically financing costs, which we deal with in all of our rate proceedings at the PUC uh, are, are reviewed by uh, parties and ultimately decided on by the commission whether or not that is a reasonable um, cost to incur and pass on to our customers uh, given the fact that there is no free money uh, for us to provide our business. You know, and maybe one foundational thing, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop, um, is that we invest in our business uh, in new pipe for new construction, replacement of old pipe to make sure we can provide safe and reliable service. We invest more in, in our business than the business provides in revenue through rates right? Which means I have no choice but to go access capital through one of these traditional routes to continue to invest in the system. And that's why traditionally those financing costs are passed on in rates after that um, review at the commission. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a follow-up. So, you know, we, we heard from the prior bill, the Julie Sansed bill uh, for municipalities. Um, and what we heard from them is they, in order to kind of, as their buffer, they use from a financing standpoint, their reserves. Kind of how did that work out for Centerpoint? Um, I believe you're the only utility pushing this bill that supports it. Um, how did they do it? Did you use reserves to finance 100% of the cost increase 
or did you go out on the market and get a percentage of open market money? And then, you know, how did that work? Did you, did you use some of your own money for financing and did you go all 100% out? What kind of was your percentage of spread? Mr. Wright. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so we did go and borrow money on a short-term basis to pay the bills that we received from the Winter Storm URI uh, gas costs. Um, that short-term debt um, will need to be refinanced, I think, Representative, it, it's in place through about this time next year. And so we will need to refinance it because uh, we agreed to spread the recovery of those costs over a 63 month period. So that will take us um, you know, another three plus years of financing that we'll need to put in place uh, to, to cover that. We don't have uh, reserves for um, the cost of methane uh, that, that we incur to provide service to our customer. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So who is paying that finance cost now that you're not recovering from your rate payers? Mr. Ryan. Center Point, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Center Point Energy is. Representative Swazinski. Representative Swazinski, did you have a follow-up? So what funds are you using for that? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Are you using reserves to pay that interest rate or are you going to your investors? Mr. Ryan. Um, we do not have a reserve that, that pays for that. That is a cost that is borne by our shareholders. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my understanding is you're currently doing less of a payout to your investors uh, as far as dividends to kind of make up the difference. So it's my understanding you're using a uh, lower payout to investors to make up the difference. Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, Mr. Ryan. I think that's a fair way to think about it, yes. Uh, Ms. levinson Falk looked like you wanted to chime in as well. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Swazinski. I really appreciate that um, where your line of questioning started because that was where exactly where my mind went when I so thinking about this bill and securitization in the context of our most recent example, which is being those winter storm URI costs. It's, I mean, it, frankly, it's a little hard for me to get too excited thinking about it, um, knowing that um, for that winter storm, we, you know, Minnesota or the, the PUC did order the utilities to cover all the financing costs. So customers are better off under the current situation for that event, then I think they would have been with securitization where they would, even if financing is low, there would be some cost to that. Um, and so, I mean, but I think the question is then like, do we think that that kind of an order or even utilities voluntarily doing so is likely in the future? And I, I just don't think we can count on that. It's really unusual for, um, for the commission to tell utilities they have to eat the financing costs. I mean, those are, that's typically, as Mr. Ryan said, that customers are expected to pay that. Um, and so it's, you know, I also think it's possible, maybe it's less likely you have a situation like that if you have a securitization option that's kind of a middle of the road option. But I think it, you know, in other extreme situations where you do, you know, have a surprise huge bill like this, the most likely situation is that customers are gonna have to pay those costs. So even given, you know, the way that it was handled this time um, and the good outcome we had, I, I still think it's better to have the tool available in the future because it, it might be that it would be needed. Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just kind of a, a follow up to that. And I appreciate you, uh, Annie uh, Levinson Falk, uh, for that comment on, you know, that you at least admit that this would be a higher cost option for um, the ratepayers. Um, you know, and I think this. You know, what, what concerns me about this is I've got a couple other concerns too. Represent Rest, as I talked to you about uh, this cost recovery on seasonal use. So, like the farmers that are using pro or natural gas in November and October, who are seeing higher rates to repay this when they never use it during this um, critical time, which I, I appreciate the, the sand seed bill that actually you know, carves that out. And she seems willing to work with me. And, I, and you've said you're willing to work with me. Um, so these, these guys that really didn't use it during this critical time, mostly off peak time, are getting hit with higher costs when they've already kind of paid for it and done it. You know, that protection standpoint, you know, I'm looking at 
you know, one of the insurance policies that uh, utilities do have when it comes to natural gas is setting contracts. And so, you know, if you've contracted your, your usage throughout the year, you know, that is your protection. And what I fear is that if we make it too profitable or, or too lucrative, um, you know, if you've read the book uh, by uh, Mark Kennedy, kind of the, uh, it's called Shape Holders. And it talks about, you know, kind of activist uh, shareholders within companies that are pushing policies that may not be beneficial to themselves, but um, kind of give the virtue signaling that we're pretty accustomed to when it comes to legislating and policy making within the utility se sector. That if the investors are able to push center point into policies that would maybe counteractive to their, their people because they're, that's what they want to do, um, that the only one left holding the bag is not themselves, which is under current what we did here in Minnesota, but they're able to pass any poor decisions or poor management uh, directly onto their customers and then also make interest um, on that because maybe they're the ones doing the financing themselves or maybe their their shareholders or the actual bankers doing the, the shareholding as well. So, you know, essentially this is quasi tax taxing authority in a way that, uh, you know, that's what I can, I'm a little bit concerned about. Um, you know, I'd love to hear from the other utilities on what their thoughts are, you know, on this obviously center points in a unique position uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the world they're in. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's my concerns with it. And, and uh, Thank you, Representative Swazinski. Um, Representative Rasmussen looked like you wanted to respond. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Representative Swazinski. And yes, I'm uh, committed to uh, continue to uh, work with you in terms of what, uh, you know, the, the impact that this has on agricultural customers. Um, the, just to be clear with, you know, this legislation is really viewed as a tool that the PUC would have. And the legislation requires that uh, the costs have to be found to be prudent. Um, they also have to be recoverable. And so this would be something that utilities would be uh, permitted to be uh, normally recovering. It doesn't give them any additional uh, authority to recover anything they otherwise wouldn't be able to recover. And then the last- term miserably because he's just an alternate. Please, oh, go ahead, continue the, Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then the, the last test is, does it save the end consumer money? And so it has, you know, any type of cost that would go through a securitization process would have to pass through those three tests um, and, uh, and the PUC would have to make a determination um, in order for something like this to go forward. And so just wanted to uh, make sure members and, and the public knew that that is a piece of this uh, legislation. And so it's actually required that consumers would save money uh, in order for a securitization to go through. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Um, I'd just like to add my thanks to Representative Rasmussen for bringing this bill forward. And I think uh, Ms. levinson Falk put it well, which is, you know, you can look at any particular uh, instance like the URI costs and, and what the alternatives might be there, but we don't really know what the, what the next event might be or what the costs might look like. And, and we don't know what the best way to approach that would be. So giving the option for uh, utilities to make an application to the Public Utility Commission to apply for costs that would be recoverable. Uh, so the, you know, the Public Utilities Commission would retain discretion there and to make sure that it would be savings to ratepayers seems to make a lot of sense and 26 other states have thought so too. So I uh, appreciate uh, Representative Rasmussen bringing this bill over. Um, seeing no further uh, questions from members, the uh, bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen. Uh, oh, ap apologies. I, um, uh, my staff is telling me we had another uh, public commenter whom I, whom I missed. Um, uh, Cameron Rather, are you here? Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, go ahead. I, I apologize. I didn't, uh, didn't no problem. see you on the list earlier. Uh, please, please proceed with your testimony. My name is Cameron Rather. I'm a resident of Minnesota. I reside in rural Good Thunder. I'm the president of an energy consulting company with clients across North America. Over the last 35 years in the industry business work, I've developed views on natural gas business based on firsthand experiences. It's apparent this bill was a result of the February 2021 Texas debacle. I'm painfully aware of this 
as I was on the receiving end of this mess for five long days, managing 14 manufacturing plants in six states. As a result, I have considerable insight to what went wrong and why. This poor polar vortex certainly can be considered an act of God, but once it hit Texas, it became an act of incompetence that extended across the country. Their actions and decisions directly drove the cost of natural gas to absurd levels. For example, as increased power generation was coming online to fix this, a computer program was shutting off plants. In another case, natural gas compressors on pipelines were converted to electric compressors to have a smaller carbon footprint. They stopped working when the power went out and the gas flows ground to a halt. The Texas debacle was an extraordinary situation. Unfortunately, I fear, fear extraordinary will become commonplace, and I am concerned that the use of bonds could become the norm for expenses. Creating a bond program to deal with the financial impact of the problems after the fact is fine. I, I would consider why aren't we doing more to address the root cause of the problem? I have to say the best thing that happened from the debacle in Texas is the entire board of the Texas Railroad Commission resigned. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Rather. Um, so I have laid the bill over. Um, we are, uh, our agenda is finished for the day. Thank you, Representative Rasmussen, for presenting your bill. And with that, we are adjourned.